Number 177, make thee a servant.
teacher, there's not just one pastor or evangelist, but this is in a plurality, some, he says. And he says, with an S on the end, apostles, teachers, pastors, etc. Now this is not speaking of a messenger word prophet, but the fivefold gifts for the church. And notice what these gifts are given to the church for. He says, for the perfecting of the saints. That means for the maturing or the equipping of the saints or sanctified ones. This is not speaking of church members. It's speaking of those who are holy. Those who live a life that's worthy of the gospel. To prepare God's people for works of service, he says. Now this word works of service is the same word work that Jesus used in John 14, 12. So we see that the fivefold gifts to the church are to equip the people so that the works that Jesus did they may also do. From a sermon, take, uh, taking on the whole armor of God, Brother Branham said, John 14, 12, Jesus said, He that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also. What is it? So he's reading John 14, 12. He says, what is it? It's God in the church in these five predestinated offices, backing up every word that he said with the Holy Spirit himself in there, which is the word made manifest, proving his resurrection, proving that he lives. All other religions are dead. Their forms are dead. There's only one that's right, and that's Christianity, because Christ is a living in the church of Christ. Amen. Making his word manifest, for he is the same. And if it's the same word, it will do the same thing and show the same works and the same signs. Matthew 28 says so. So we see, according to the vindicated prophet William Brown, that John 14, 12 has to do with not only his own ministry, but with the fivefold ministry itself and with the church. And if the fivefold ministry is given to the church to help the church or equip the church to do the works of God, then how do you expect the fivefold ministry to equip the church if they themselves are not equipped to do the works of God themselves? Right? right. Sure. In other words, the fivefold ministry, you've got to see that manifesting in them, then it will manifest in you. And if the fivefold ministry are not equipped themselves, then there are certainly will be no evidence of John 14, 12 among them. But what if you have a fivefold ministry whose ministry has manifested John 14, 12? I'm asking questions now. And what if that man's church has seen God's supernatural presence manifest itself after sincere prayer to God? And what if that ministry has also had numerous signs of God's presence with it and doing things that no man could do? Then why would other fivefold ministers not want what God is doing in that ministry? Those are the questions. But if they have those signs following, then why wouldn't they want for others in their own church to have them also? And what if this vindicated prophet we claim to follow said that the church must come to this expression or manifestation of God's life in the church before the church can be raptured or made ready for the rapture? What if I can show you that God's vindicated prophet told us that the elect sons and daughters of God will have to come to this expression or manifestation which we see spoken of in John 14, 12, or they will not be raptured? Amen. And what if I could show you the essentiality of what I've been teaching for these past seven years is an essential truth of God that John 14, 12 must manifest itself in the bride as a sign that she is ready for adoption or she will not go in the rapture and she will not be adopted. And what if I can show you that this is the pre prerequisite for the rapture of the church? And that makes what we're looking at and what we have been focusing on a little more essential to our walk with God, doesn't it? You see, Paul said the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to equip the people with this knowledge of the Son of God. And that comes via our understanding the true revelation of Jesus Christ, which is a Godhead relationship between Father and Son, and understanding exactly how this relationship between God and the Son worked, so that we can understand how it's supposed to work with us. William Brennan, prophet of God, understood this real well. And he entered so much into that relationship with the Father, as Jesus had done before him, that he and God became one expression and one manifestation in this hour. In fact, William Branham was so much like Christ that people, some people actually thought he was. And Paul said the fivefold ministry are to equip the saints for the same revelation of Jesus Christ, and through the knowledge of the Son of God, it will bring the children of God into a full maturity and, ra and rapture ready. As he said, that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach a unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God so that we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fulfilling of Christ. 
Then we will no longer be infants, he says, who are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and blown here and blown there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. In other words, we're not going to be fooled. This unity he speaks of here is unity of belief. It's a unity of doctrine. There's no way that sheep can be unified by wolves in sheep's clothing because there's no unity in the faith between sheep and wolves. But the dove meets the lamb because they have the same nature. And since only born-again ones can truly be considered believers, true genuine believers, then only true born-again sons and daughters of God are the only ones who can manifest Christ's life through their vessels. True fivefold shepherds will make an effort to try to help the wandering sheep those who want a wonder about this and wonder about that, but once the wolf has that sheep, unless he can get to that sheep while it still has breath, he can, he, uh, he can possibly restore it. But sometimes the wolf gets away with the sheep and kills it before it can struggle to get free. That is why the shepherd has to be ruthless in the way that he deals with wolves, spying out a sheep, ready to kill when possible. Because its nature is a predator and he seeks only to maim and to kill. In Luke 15, in verse 4, we read, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and rejoices, saying, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. The Bible is clear that many people have and will continue to wander away from the faith. And usually it boils down to one thing, and that's money. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money, they have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 to 21, he says, Timothy, guard what, what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and, and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Great be with you. And from James 5, 19 to 20, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whosoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So we need to help those who've wandered away, who've fallen into the fire, so to speak, while being careful not to get burned ourselves or soil our own, soil our own clothing in the mess that they have made for themselves. In Jude 1, to 23, he says, be, be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them, to others show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So we need to be mindful that we have all wandered at times, and, we, and we've all gone astray, but the point is to return to the shepherd. In 1 Peter 2 and 25, we read, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have turned, returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So the shepherd would bring the flock home to the fold at night. He would then lay down in the gate physically to protect the sheep from wolves coming into the sheepfold. He literally put his own life on the line for the sheep. In John chapter 10, 1 to 13, we read, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is a shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes out ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they, they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used his, this figure of speech, but they did not understand that he, what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All whoever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. And the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now we learn some important things about being a good shepherd under this passage. First of all, shepherd is a watchman. There are not only savage wolves out in the world, but there are savage wolves who have entered in among the flock at an alarming rate. 
In Acts 2.29, he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. In Matthew 7.15, he says, watch out for false prophets. They shall come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now, the wolves that try to enter the fold make themselves look like sheep. They talk like sheep. They pray like sheep. They make themselves look ultra holy. They say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this in your name? They claim to be doing all the things a Christian should do, having a form of godliness, but in reality, they deny the power that comes with a true born-again experience. <coughs> but Jesus warned us how to spot them. He said, by their fruits you will know them. The fruits of lying, the fruits of false works, the fruits of false doctrine, the fruits of false motives, the fru fruits of false anointing, or simply of following false apostles and trying to be justified by their works. The shepherd sees through their motives and objectives, and he calls them what they are, evildoers. Now, in Matthew 7, 21, we read, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy that means preaching your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform any miracles, and I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So if the fivefold shepherds do not protect the flock against the wolves, then they are just... They are just as responsible for the destruction the wolf causes under their watch. They're just as responsible as the wolf is. In Ezekiel 33, 6-7 we read, But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, that man will take, be taken away because of his sins. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel, so hear the word that I speak and give them warning from me. So God has made every fivefold shepherd a watchman. There are many ways or gates of gaining entrance to the flock of any church. Those gates include the gate of the ministry through music, the gate of serving on a board in the church, even the gate of the pulpit. And it is through the many gates or portals into the church or people <coughs> in the body of Christ, but have a different agenda than the shepherd has. Remember the shepherd, it's just like, you know, if we have a song service and, and the song service and the songs go in a certain direction and the pastor comes in and he preaches a different direction. You see, just watch, by their fruits you shall know them. Or you have uh, deacons or, or trustees on a, on a board and they're trying to control and, and, you know, be big shots and everything else and the pastor trying to get the people to be humble. You see, there's a different, there's not the same objective, there's not the same motive. Now remember the shepherd is to equip the sheep for doing the works of Christ in order to build up the body of Christ that it might manifest Christ to the world. But the wolf has his own agenda and, and, and at the expense of the sheep, it is of self-satisfaction. It matters not to the wolf if the sheep are scattered. In fact, it's better for him because he, then he can one by one take advantage of them. So it is a responsibility of the shepherd to drive away the wolf from among the sheep in any shape, way, or form it can do it. And I can never see, I, I've never seen a wolf driven away from a flock with honey and sweet talking. It don't happen that way. So why would it happen in the fold? But the wolf has one purpose, and that is to separate the sheep because where there's unity, there's strength. And so he comes in to disrupt the unity of the faith, that, that faith that produces, that uh, uh, by trying to make the sheep think that the faith has some other objective. Just like when the serpent said to Eve, thou shalt not surely die. He quoted the scripture, but he added his own little incentive there. And God heard to break faith from God. And thus, uh, it weakens their faith, and thus it weakens their unity. And that is how the serpent beguiled Eve. Now remember, <clears throat> how many of you have ever saw that, uh, it's called the battle, at, uh, it's, it's a, on the big uh, uh, natural reserve in, in Africa, and where, the, where actually the, the, the lions came in and they took one of the little uh, oxen or the little water buffaloes and they were pulling on it, pulling on it, pulling on it and then they, the, the thing made its way to the water but then a crocodile grabs him from the other end and so there's a tug of war between the crocodile and the, and the wolf I mean and the, uh, and, and the lions well finally the lions win and they pull them on shore then the buffalo which are usually you know I mean they're not sheep exactly but uh, you know they, they actually come in and they start to because they're unified they, they, they go in and they attack the, the lions you see, if the lions can get them separated, then they can work on one. But when they stay unified, the lions couldn't get to them. 
Well, that's just a good natural text of spiritual type of thing. <coughs> so the shepherd will lay his body down in the gate to protect the flock so that they can rest. And so the shepherd risks his reputation, he risks his friendships, he risks his livelihood, and perhaps even sometimes his own life for the flock. But if there are too many hirelings in the churches today who do not do the job that they were given a stewardship over, because they do not want to offend anyone or any, anything. And thus, by in, in, an inability to take a firm stand, they make themselves useless to the good shepherd. And they allow great evil to take a, fo a foothold in the flock that they have been given stewardship over. So on their watch, they refuse to take the stand needed to ensure the safety of the flock. In John 10, verse 12, we read, But he that is in hiring and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, See if the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. Those who are called to be fivefold shepherds in the body of Christ must take their responsibility seriously, but many do not. There are far too many who claim to be fivefold ministers of God, but demonstrate clearly that they are not qualified to be shepherds according to God's criteria because they will not take a stand on holiness issues and doctrinal issues, doctrinal teaching. The fivefold ministry is given to the church to prepare the church for the rapture. That's all. That's it. What can the fivefold ministry do to help you to get prepared for the rapture? In his sermon, believe us out of this, Brother Brown said, Now remember this. If, if, if he preaches the gospel, stay with him, help him, because he's a man sent from God, ordained of God to feed your soul. And in this very same sermon, Christ is, re Christ is the mystery of God revealed that we're reading here now. In paragraph 43, Brother Brown said, Love one another above everything. Love one another. Don't, no matter what the devil tries to say, now you're all one great big sweet group now. But remember my warning. See, Satan won't let it stay that way. No, sir. He'll shoot everything he has to bring somebody in and make him his target. He'll bring in some critic or unbeliever in. He'll set him down and cause him to fellowship with you under the quietness and things. Then he will shoot that guy with some kind of a poison stuff, and he'll start throughout the church with it. Don't you take sides with it. Don't you have nothing to do with it. You stay right, loving, and sweet, and kind one to another. Pray for that man that can be saved too, and that woman, ever who it is. Just pray for them and stick one with another and stay with your pastor. See, he's a shepherd, and you give him respects. He'll lead you through because he is ordained of God to do so. So the fivefold shepherd is ordained of God, and in fact, God ordains him and sets him over the flock to feed the flock, to bring them to, to where the food is in due season. And, and, he, and he helps to water them by the washing of water by the word. He helps to groom them for sonship roles and clipping them uh, when, when necessary. And, 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 and uh, you know, that's what we call dressing down. And uh, to ensure that they do not wander away from the sheepfold. He helps to deliver new lambs, leading them and teaching them how to follow the word. And sometimes he, he has to go off uh, after sheep that have wandered off and he protects the sheep of the, of the, uh, of the fold from predatory spirits. But let's get back to Ephesians 4 again, where, he, where we see that God has placed in the church certain ones to equip the saints to prepare God's people for the works of service. And as I made a statement earlier in this message, uh, uh, that's what I'd like to address now. So we're going to kind of, we've gone through the thoughts on what the shepherd is for. Now I, I want to show you one of the specific things, and that's to get you ready for the rapture. That's to get you ready to become mature and, and, and built up into Christ. And as I mentioned earlier, what if I can show you that God's vindicated prophet told us that the elect sons and daughters of God will have to come to this expression or manifestation which we saw in Jesus himself as he spoke in John 14, 12, or they will not be raptured. And what if I can show you the essentiality of what I've been teaching these past seven years is an essential truth of God that John 14, 12 must manifest itself in the bride as a sign she is ready for adoption or she will not go in the rapture. Amen. And what if I can show you that this is a prerequisite for the rapture of the church? Then that makes what we're looking at and what we are, have been focusing on a little bit more essential to our walk with God than most would think. Now the same apostle prophesied in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy. Holy. That means sanctified and set aside for service and without blame in his presence in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So number one, he predestinated us to be holy, then adopted. Holy, then adopted. Sanctified, then adopted. 
Ephesians 1 and 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So it's not your will, it's his will. Then what do you have to do with your will, like Jesus did? Father, not my will, but thy will be done. You've got to completely die to yourself or God can't use you at all. Galatians 4 and 5, for redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Romans 8, 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, which we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. How are you going to get a redempted body if the mind isn't redempted? You know, Paul says that you receive your transformation by the renewing of your mind. The inner man is renewed daily, the outer man perishes. Romans 8.15, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we have, since the first church age, the spirit of adoption has been in the church to get the people in a condition to where they're adoptable. But the manifestation of the spirit of adoption has been reserved for right before the very end. Right before the rapture. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit, that's God's Spirit, itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How does God's Spirit bear witness with your spirit? How does it do it? By a mental understanding? No, in fact, the word revelation means a manifestation of divine truth. God, Spirit, identifies your spirit is in harmony with his spirit by doing the things that Jesus said. Jesus said, the things that I do shall you do also. The words I speak, you'll speak. The actions I take, you'll take. You understand? Then he goes on to say, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And the children, the heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory, that word is dosa, that means the opinion, the value, the judgments, which shall be revealed in us. What is revelation? It's manifestation. Revelation is manifestation of divine truth. So, the glory, the values, the assessments, the, the opinions of God, the judgments of God shall be revealed in us. That's what he says. For the earnest expectation of the creature, of all creation, is waiting for the manifestation, or the expression, or the revealing, or the unveiling of the sons of God. In other words, there, in other words, look, the spirit of adoption has been in the church all six church ages. But it's only at the end time that comes forth a manifestation of that spirit of adoption. Now, <clears throat> for the creature was made subject to vanity, but not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. So why do you groan? Because you do something that you shouldn't do. As Paul said, you know, because we're in the body of this death, he said, when I wouldn't do good, I, he said, there's evil present. So you groan, oh no, Lord, not, not again. That's what he's saying. We groan because even in our own hearts, we're longing to be just like Christ. As, as Paul goes on to say in verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He is the eldest son in a vast family of brothers. So what does it mean to be conformed to the image of the firstborn son? He's not talking about wearing sandals and having a beard. He's talking about having the same character, the same nature. Thinking the same thing, speaking the same words, doing the same actions and doing the same words. That's why Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child because I thought as a child. But when I become a, a man, I put away childish thinking. And when we, when we are conformed to the image of the firstborn son, we put away that human thinking. We put away that, that flesh thinking. And our whole total being is subject to the Father and to the will of the Father because... We'll have the testimony of Enoch. That's what Brother Brown said. When the bride catches the rapture, she'll have the testimony that Enoch had. And what was that? That he pleased God. 
<clears throat> you see? And Jesus said, my whole desire, my need is to please the Father. But if the same Spirit of God, that's verse 11, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He, God, that raised up Jesus from Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by God's Spirit that dwells in you. And remember, the mortal body is this body we're living in now because mortal means able to die. We're not talking about the carcass that comes out of the ground at that point. That's a carcass. We're talking about the body you're living in now. God is more than able to make your body obey your confession. So, that means if you have the same Spirit of God dwelling in you that dwell also in Jesus, and remember by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, then you will not only think the same thoughts, but you will speak the same words. And, and, and so what He did, you will do, and, and you will do the same works that He did, because it is God which is working in you, both to will and to do. That's what Paul said in Philippians 2.13. And the only way you can do that is by God dwelling in you. And the only way God will dwell in you is you've got to die. <clears throat> as, I, as I mentioned last week, if I take up a bottle and I, and I grab the bottle, that's justification. If I decide to clean it up, that's sanctification. But God will not place His, His Holy Spirit in a vessel that is living in sin. He won't do it. You wouldn't take a vessel and say, well, half of it's got uh, poison in it. I'll fill the other half with milk and give it to our little baby. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't say, well, it's got 10% arsenic in it, but the rest will be good milk, so it'll be good for the baby. You wouldn't do that. And God will not take your vessel if it's filled with the things of the world, because he said, he said if you love the world and the things of the world, the love of God won't be in you. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> and God is that love. So, brother and God will make your, your body obey your confession. See, he's the high priest of our confession. Before you can be healed, you have to confess it first. You have to believe that you're healed. And then when you believe that you're healed, God makes your body obey your confession. When you come to the place where you can say, Father, you said in your word that I'm to be conformed to the image of the firstborn son. Uh, you said I am to become a manifested son. You said in your word, I have received the spirit of adoption. <clears throat> if, you, if you say, God, this is your command, I believe it, then you've got to step into it. As Brother Brown said to Moses, God said to Moses, speak and go forward. But if Moses would have just spoke, and that's the way most of the people in this message are, most people that are Christians, so-called Christians, they just speak a lot, they talk a lot. But he said to Moses, speak and go forward. And Brother Brown said, if Moses had not placed his foot into the water, the water would not have parted. You see, you've got to step into your confession. You're not, not just talking. It's got to come forth. It's not, if, if you talk in the light, as he is in the light. The Bible says if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. <clears throat> so Paul says in verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he hath also, past tense, glorified. <clears throat> now in closing, I'd just like to read a few quotations from Brother Brown, God's vindicated prophet, concerning where we are to be right before God takes us in the rapture. From Hear Ye Him, preached 313 of 1960, paragraph 32, Brother Brown said, in the Old Testament, when it was wrote out and then tore apart, then they come together, it had to dovetail. He talked about the contract. You take a piece of paper, the Chinaman would, you go to his shop, and you say, well, I want to buy, you know, I, I want to, uh, to, to uh, leave my clothes with you, and uh, in order to, to, to have a ticket, instead of writing them out, because they wrote Chinese, you wouldn't be able to understand Chinese. So he took a piece of paper, and he, and he, and he tore it a certain way, and Brother Brown said, Those, that was a contract. You got one side of the contract, he got the other side of the contract. And when the contract had to come together and fit perfectly together, or you didn't have the contract. You understand? And so God tore the Spirit out of His Son, Jesus. And if you don't have that same spirit, that same life, that same character in you, you're not going to go in a rapture. That's what he's saying. I'm just going to read. Each piece of paper had to fit right in, and the whole program had to line up right. God confirmed his covenant with the people through Isaac to Christ. And at Calvary, he tore the Messiah apart. He took the body and set it on his own right hand and, and sent the spirit down here upon the church. And the church will have to have the same spirit doing the same things that Jesus did, or it will never go in the rapture. That's powerful from a vindicated problem. He says, I'm going to read again, then the church will have to have the same spirit doing the same things. That's John 14, 12. Or it will never go in the rapture. Now, from hearing him again, paragraph 37. <clears throat> now, you see, Jesus had proven to God 
that he'd been the right kind of a son. And God took him up on, on top of the mountain, brought witnesses out there, heavenly witnesses and earthly witnesses, and he clothed him in immortality. When he looked up, they said, his garment shined like the sun. A supernatural something had taken place. His garment glistened like the sun in the middle of the day, as white as it could be. God placed on him the robe of immortality, showing that he had received him. And that's the thing that God will do to his sons here on earth someday. He will call you aside, church, if you'll only obey him and stay on the word and believe it. And he will place into the church before the coming of Jesus Christ. He will place into the church all power, all the powers that Christ had in him will be in the church. All that God was, he poured into Jesus Christ. All that Jesus was, he poured into the church. God wanting his work done, he sent, he sent it into his son. The son wanting the work done, he sent it into the church. At that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, the Father in me, I am you and you and me. At that day, because the same power of God was in Jehovah, God, God rested in Jesus Christ. The same power that rested in Jesus Christ rests in the placed sons in the body of Christ. Placing of a son. Take him out to a certain place, have a certain uh, ceremony before angels, and place him positionally what he was in the body of Christ. Then that person has the authority. Let me say this, if you count me a fanatic from right on, the very, the, the very same thing that I'm speaking of will be done. There will be a power, now, you know, notice how he says that. He said, let me say this, you may, if you count me a fanatic from right on. Now, now some of you people are going to count me a fanatic. That's what Brother Hoyer said to Brother Vale in, 19, in, the, in the early 70s. He said, Lee, he said, I, I don't want you to, to think that I'm a fanatic at what I'm saying, but he said, for my study of the Greek and the Aramaic, he said, there's got to come the power of creative, uh, of creative power into the church before the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> Why do we say, don't consider me a fanatic? Why do they consider me a fanatic? It's because we're saying what God says is going to happen. We're, we're focusing on what's supposed to happen because why would I want to focus on something over here if I want to be over here? Why would I focus on a map of, of, uh, of, of Minneapolis if, I want to, if I'm driving around Cincinnati? You understand? Why would I be focusing on, 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 on something else over here in Luther's day or Wesley's day when, God, what I, when I, I should be focusing on what God has for us in this day? You see? <clears throat> so he says the same power that rested in Jesus Christ rests in the place Sons in the body of Christ. Placing of a son. Take him out to a certain place. Have a ceremony before the angels. Place him positionally what he is in the body of Christ. Then that person has the authority. Now let me say this. If you count me a fanatic from this night on, that very same thing I'm speaking of will be done. There will be a power put into the church and now is coming on or coming in that the Holy Spirit will so anoint people till they'll speak the word and it will create itself right there. We haven't seen powers like that coming into the church until now. I know it for a fact. Why? Because of squirrels. Say unto this mountain, be moved, don't doubt in your heart. You believe what, 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 uh, what you said shall come to pass. You can have what you said. The placing of the church in position where the fullness of the power of the Holy Ghost will come into the church, then critics' mouths will be shut. It will be a short time. Jesus come right off the mountain and went straight to Calvary. But notice, it won't last long, but it will be here. That's that short, quick word yeah. Brother Brandon was looking for. Now from Jehovah Jireh, he said, and the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus Christ will have to be operating in his church to make them coincide together at the rapture, or it won't go up at that time. The Spirit was, that was in Jesus will have to be in his church, or the two pieces won't dovetail together. The life of the church and the life of Christ cannot dovetail together. Unless the Spirit of Christ is there doing it. Now, from I perceive you to be a prophet, he said, O oh, oh God, grant today... That when we can all come together and see all those nine spiritual gifts moving through the church, operating the church, the whole body, uh, uh, church body, then we'll have the rapture. Then it will be called out and we'll have the rapture. If we can't have faith for divine healing now, how are we going to have faith for rapturing faith? The church has got a ways to go yet, but I believe God will do it. Remember, it's God working in you to willing to do. So it's not you working at all, it's just you're dying to yourself. So that he can use your vessel. <clears throat> That's exactly what Jesus said. Now he said, it's not the son that worketh. The father worketh and the son worketh hitherto. He said, the son can of himself do nothing. But what he seeth the father do, that the son doeth like what? Now from question and answer, COD said, I don't care how good you are, what church you belong to, how good your parents was, except you as an individual have been born again by the Holy Ghost, you'll never go in the rapture. See, you can't go. That's the very delivery sign, the circumcision, and the circumcision is by the Holy Ghost. 
Or show us the Father, divine healing and the power of God and all these other things that is in every individual in here has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For you're planted in Christ. As Brother Bell said, the potentiality is right there. It's in there. It's already there. We're waiting on God's timing. Hallelujah, the Holy Ghost baptism, yes sir, and everything you have need of for this life journey, even the rapture, is right in you then. From Abraham, he said, and if you ever go into rapture, you're going to have to have the same spirit in you that was on Jesus Christ. That's God's covenant with his church, amen. And from faithful Abraham, he said, the same spirit that, uh, that same Christ has to be in this church. The same Holy Ghost that dwells in Christ dwells in us. And when the rapture comes, them two pieces has got to come together and be the same church that Christ died for. From Balm, Balm and Gilead, he said, God's looking for somebody who will take the sword of the word. Some people are afraid to say those things. Don't be afraid. God, God before you, who can be against you? It's time that the church stood in its place again, cut sin. Jesus, Jesus will come together and there will be a rapture. Those who stand for him now, he will stand for, for him, for them then. And from what the Holy Ghost was given for, he said, God's waiting on me and you. The church is waiting on me and you. Adoption time. When God can pour it, into, into us his fullness, his power, his resurrection. That when the church and Christ becomes so close together till Christ becomes visible among us and raise the dead and we go into the rapture now, now we're going to say, uh, show after a while that just those who are filled with the Holy Ghost goes in the rapture. For the rest of the dead will not live for the space of a thousand years. That's right. Just Holy Ghost filled people was all that went in the rapture. Now listen. When Brother Graham says God's got to call out his bride, you know what that is? If you ever were on, on a cattle ranch, you know that when they get on the horses, they do kind of a figure eight, and they call out, they, they, they separate the flock down, and they have to separate again, they separate again, separate again until they get to one or two calves that they need to brand, or, or if they've got pneumonia, you know, they need to give an injection. But they have, that's called calling out, and God is calling out a bride. In other words, he's getting rid, getting rid, getting rid, until the very end. There's a quote where Brother Brown says, at the very end, a sinner would not dare to walk into the sanctuary. Why? We're getting ready for a rapture. Sinners won't go in the rapture. If we are sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, you understand? From Jehovah Jireh, he said he lifted up the body and set it on his right hand and set the other part down, the Holy Spirit down on the church. And when the rapture comes, it'll have to be the same spirit that was on Christ. We'll have to dovetail with that promise or it will be rejected. Now, what do you mean dovetail? You know what we're talking about. What do you mean dovetail? <clears throat> it means the works that I do shall you do also. The things that I do, the actions that I say, I, I, I mean my, my speech and my action, my thought process, it'll be in the church. He says it will have to dovetail with that promise or it will be rejected. No wonder he said it has to be the same Holy Spirit that except the man be born again, he will in no wise enter the kingdom. Fell on the day of Pentecost. Has to baptize every believer or it won't be the same spirit and, and contract that was toward Calvary. Now think of that. Oh, that ought to make Pentecost shout. Uh, uh, that ought to make the Pentecost, the Pentecost shout anything. Think of it. The unconditional covenant. God said it has to be, and he tore apart soul body, the soul and body of his own son. He took the body and sent the spirit to the church. And that spirit can come into the church today and perform the same miracles, showing, the pe showing and the people will laugh at it and walk away from it. How do you expect to make the rapture or go in to see God? There we are. Maybe you've never seen that before, but that's the truth. Now, you see... See why it's necessary that you've got to be born of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of Christ has to be in you because it has to be the same Spirit. Take your body to be joined with that body. The same Spirit that was tore off of Christ, tore out of Christ, or, G or Jesus. And if that Spirit is in you, it'll make you do the same things that Christ did. It'll make you live the life that Christ lived. And Christ was about the Father's business all the time, not getting about uh, at shows or entertainment. He was about the Father's business. And from Jehovah Jireh, paragraph 57. When that Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, it produced a church. And brother, I don't care what denomination you got tapped to you, except the spirit that was torn out of Christ is put into the man, he will, he will be left on the day of judgment. He tore him apart and sent the Holy Spirit down, which lives in us, the Holy Spirit of Christ, working in us, doing the same works that Christ did, living the same life, doing the same things, and outside of the... Out, and the outside world stands and they make fun of it. 
Others say that there's nothing to it. Some try to mock it. Others receive it. But brother, that's the only way that God ever makes you a seed of Abraham is when the Spirit of Christ comes into you, then you become the seed of Abraham. That's right. And the Gentile is included in that covenant. And from Hebrews chapter 7, he said, and, and he sent the Spirit that tore, <clears throat> that tore out of that body right back down upon the church. And that church will have to have the same Spirit that was in that body or it won't dovetail with it in the resurrection. Those two pieces must come perfectly together. And if the church is perfectly, it, it isn't perfectly just exactly the same Spirit that was in Christ, you'll never go in the rapture. You see, time and time again, there's actually hundreds of places where Brother Brown is pointing us to this, that there's got to come a time, brothers and sisters, we are so perfectly in harmony. In our spirit. That's when we're magnetized. That's when we go. Understand? From here you him, he said, Remember the same waters that drown the world, save Noah. That's right. And the same Holy Spirit and the same old fashioned gospel that will that will take the church home someday in the rapture will condemn and bring judgment to the unbeliever. And from why Christ speak? Jesus said, The works that I do, uh, he that believeth on me, St. John 4, 14, 7, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, he that believeth on me. No, no man can believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God until he's received the Holy Ghost. You're only talking it, you're only taking it by faith and accepting it. You can't say that it is. You can say, I believe it is, but no man can call Jesus the Christ until the Holy Ghost is in him. The Bible says so. The Holy Ghost has to come in first, then it gives witness. You know yourself that Jesus is the Christ because he lives in you. That's the witness. So when you come to the place where you finally see Jesus Christ living in you, now you can say, I know what it means when it says that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed. And no man can say that until he comes in and lives in you. Then that same Holy Spirit introduces himself to the people, and these signs shall follow them that believe. And the church laughs at it and makes fun of it. We're just living in that day. The atmosphere getting charged up for the atomic bomb for judgment. The church is getting ready for the rapture. We're waiting, anticipating, waiting, to, uh, waiting, uh, waiting. The church is waiting for the coming of the Lord. The world is shaking, wondering. Uh, which is going to be the first one to get the bomb? We don't care which one gets, gets there. We're going here. So it doesn't matter which one gets there. It doesn't, doesn't have a thing to do with it. We're just rejoicing and we're happy and believing that one day we'll hear a sound from heaven and, and, and here he'll come. And his church will be caught up in the air to meet him and be with him. I, I, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And from the message Abraham in closing. <clears throat> he says, if you ever go in the rapture, you're going to have to have the same spirit in you that was on Jesus Christ. That's God's covenant with his church. Amen. Don't you take a cold, formal handshake. You take a heartwarming experience of God of being born again. Don't care what you belong to. Jesus said, because God, because God, and now remember, <clears throat> when these two met together, if these did, didn't dovetail, it was thrown out. It had to be the same thing. And the same spirit was upon Christ has to be on the church. God came in the body of Christ and set it on, on his right hand of power above, and he sent the Holy Ghost back, and it's going around looking up, uh, looking out the church. And when they come together, it'll have to be the same body, the same signs, the same wonders, the same baptism, same signs and wonders, same gospel, amen, that's right. Now, in closing, I'm going to read something that Brother Vale spoke from the adoption number two, his, his sermon, adoption number two. This is Brother Vale. Now, reading from the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, just one verse at a time, the 15th verse at this time. For you have not received the spirit of a bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, in the, in the first message on this subject, which was last night, we showed from the prophet's teaching that there would be a word-identified bride who would be able to manifest the very life of Christ at the end time, quoting Brother Branham. There'll be a power coming to the church, and now he's coming into the church, that the Holy Spirit will so anoint the people, plural, so that they'll, plural, speak the word, and it is, and, and it, the word, will, will create itself like that, or identical to what was spoken. And Brother Bell now says, so you see, when God said, and he said that too, but he's quoting Brother Brown. So you see, when God said, let there be light, suddenly something didn't say, well, I think I'll have a little fun here, and, uh, and, 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 and let it be dark. No, it was light, see? Therefore, the word which will be in the bride will be a literal manifestation into creation of that same word by the same spirit that lies in the word. There will be a literal creation. Now, that's what the prophet said. Do you agree with that, what he said? All right, fine. We believe it. Now, notice the language of the prophet. He said, now, N-O-W. At this time, it is coming into the church. That means only one thing. 
The potential is already in the bride of this hour, and if, and if the potential will produce the manifestation in her of creation by spoken word, God is going to refill the bride with the Spirit. Then see what happens. Brother Bram said, we've got a ministry coming that just excites exactly like the life of Christ. Now, that's what he told us, and that's what we believe. I was preaching one time in Chicago a couple of years ago or three when Dr. Hoyer, who in my estimation is the greatest authority in the Hebrew and Greek today living, because he can speak it with the exact emphasis, the exact facial expressions, and the exact demonstration by his hands. He is a very brilliant scholar, and at the end of the service, he said, Brother Bell, I trust you will not think of me to be a fanatic, but I would like to say something, and he sounded so apologetic, I wondered what in the world he was going to say. And he said, please, 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 do not take this bad, he said. I said, well, what is it, Brother Hoyer? And he said, Brother Bell, from, from a study of the Word of God, I believe the bride will have the creative word within her before she goes in that rapture. And I said, well, Brother, that's exactly what a vindicated prophet said by thus saith the Lord. Now, here's a brilliant theologian who knows exactly the, the hour of the day. If you heard him and, and, and you could meet him and talk with him, you would know that this is a giant intellect anointed by the Holy Ghost who has studied the Word of God until... Until that's all that he knows and that's all that he lives. You mention his scripture and he'll quote you the Hebrew or the Greek and then raise his eyebrows, his face will change and an expression will come upon him and there will be literally beginning to preach in that language and tell you everything that it means. And he said, Brother Bell, I know that it's coming. I know that it is coming. So we see according to the word of God given to us by a vindicated prophet that the created world will be in the very bride at the end time. Now, this great capsule ministry of the bride is called the manifestation of the sons of God, or the adoption or the placing of the sons. And to me, I emphasize to me, it is also the manifestation of what Brother Rand called the third pole in the bride. What else can I say? We've turned that corner, we're moving into it, we're focused on it, and it's just a matter of now. It's already in us if you have the Holy Ghost. It's a matter of God telling you what to do. And I, I'm just saying, I'm not saying this to put Brian up, but that day over there in Africa, when the Holy Spirit said, take charge of the meeting, you remember I told you the story? That wasn't me, I had no power. I, I said to myself, well, you know, how can I take charge of the meeting? There's a big, huge storm, it's going to blow this building away. How in the world am I going to do it? But in, as Brother Brian said, God will make your body obey your confession. And so I, I begin, not knowing by the time I get from, from that wall to here, What's going to happen? But I took a faith. I took a step in faith. And when I did, I saw like a mental vision. I saw Jesus sitting up in the boat and, and, and ordering the, the, the storm to be calm. By the time I took my second step, I saw uh, Brother Brown running around the tree, having spoken the storm, and the storm calmed down. So I knew on the way up, I had my examples. I had the eldest brother. I had an older brother. And now I'm a brother. And the same God that told them what to do just told me to take charge of me. And I went forth, and, and the rest is history. Now, if God will do that for someone like me, why won't he do it for someone like you? You understand? We're brothers. And then when the same thing happened in the afternoon, that big storm came and, 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 and I was going to do the same thing. I was going to go pray and, I, and something spoke to me and said, if you do, they're going, to, they're going to think you're something like Brother Brown. They're sons also. So I told the brothers, I said, God wants you to pray. They prayed and the same thing happened. The storm just went away just like that. So see, God wanting his children to come to this place Knowing if you're born again, that, you know, <clears throat> if you have the Spirit of God, the life of God, Brother Brown, if you have enough power in you to create worlds and go live on them. Well, the way things are coming down today, I'd like to do that right now. But it's not God's time. You understand? Until, he's, until, look, the hat has got to be on the chair, right? You know, Brother Brown, had, the hat in the vision had to be on the chair or the vision couldn't be complete. <clears throat> We've got to come to the place where we are so much in our actions, in our talk, in our thinking, so much like Christ, then the hat's on the chair. Then God will tell you what to do, and you'll do it. That's all his prayer. Gracious Father, we're so thankful, Lord, because we know that we're walking in your way. We know we're walking in your word. These things are just opening up to us day and night, left and right, and we're getting ready, Father. We're getting ready. Help us, Lord, to die to ourselves so that you might live our life for us. For we ask it humbly in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his faith shine upon thee. No Wednesday night service, Saturday night at 7.30.